Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Matt and Lee and everyone else. Good morning, Phil. I see. I wasn't. I wasn't joking when I said I was going to make a few banter first thing. <laughs> <laughs> of course, morning, Rebecca. We'll, 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 we'll do a proper introduction to you in a minute. Great to see yeah. you. so many people dialing in already, Matt. It's um, it's proving to be a, a popular way to spend the, the Monday morning back after the uh, the Easter break. Yeah, we're up to forty-seven, which is brilliant so far. So feel free whilst you're um, whilst everyone's dialing in, and we'll get started just after ten. But feel free to uh, use the chat just to say hello and tell us where you are in the country. Because it's always nice to find out where people are. Matt, where are you in the country? Uh, I'm in my garden in Farnham. Okay, and Lee, where are you in the country? I'm right in the middle. I'm in Solihull. Ah, nice. Rebecca, where are you in the country? I am in beautiful Stroud in Gloucestershire. Oh, lovely. I'm, um, I'm on the south coast, uh, so I'm, on, uh, I'm Eastbourne. So I am, um, I'm where people go to retire, apparently. <laughs> That's what uh, we're most famous for. Uh, we've got Julian Abergavenny in Wales. Excellent. Kerry in North Wales. Uh, you really, I like the way Kerry's put that, like I'm going to be able to pronounce it. I can yeah. <laughs> my own, um, my own place of, uh, so we've got someone from Staffordshire. So we're definitely representing the, you know, some, some of the middle parts of the UK. Dan, Dan's in Christmas. Oh, lovely. Whims By the way, if anyone's just joining um, and thinking you've dialed into the wrong channel this morning, you haven't. Uh, we are going to kick off of our, our webinar shortly. But whilst everyone's dialing in, we can look at where everyone is in the UK. So Ian's, uh, yep. Um, Stephen's in Bristol. <laughs> Lisa's in Cardiff. So we've got plenty of Welsh uh, yeah. attendees but this morning. Apparently, we're big in Wales this morning. Um, so Laura in Surrey, Greg in Manchester. So we'll give everyone another minute to, to dial in. Then I'll hand over to, to, to Matt to do a, a, a more formal introduction. But if you are just dialing in, um, you can use the chat to introduce yourself. Let us know where you are in the UK. Um, and um, just as a, a bit of housekeeping for the webinar, you can also use the Q&A to ask questions. Try and keep questions to the Q&A. Um, and kind of the banter and the chat to the chat, and that way we can separate the two. Um, but uh, we've got a few more. Anyone else coming in? Well, it'd be good to see where other people are. We've got Kate in Sale, Greg in Manchester. Everyone else is shy, Matt. Everyone else is a shy about telling us where they are. We've got 75 on. Good. Well, look, we're just one minute past 10, so I think it's probably a good good time to uh to get started so matt if i hand over to you um and we've still got some more locations coming in keep them coming it's always great to see where people are coming in from fantastic stuff so um thanks phil uh good morning to everybody uh hope you've had a very pleasant weekend um i certainly did new puppy arrived yesterday so it's keeping us all very busy uh so my name's matt barnes uh, i'm sales director at walters Kluwer. Uh, tax and accounting uk um, our solutions if you haven't heard about us or of us uh, we enable tax and accounting professionals and businesses of all sizes to drive productivity navigate change and deliver better outcomes uh, so for those that uh, engaged with us on this event um, a little while back uh, up until i think it was about lunchtime on thursday this was going to be a live event held in bristol uh, we made the decision to move it to an online event. Uh, and as at this morning, there was 116 people uh, signed up to, to join. Um, I believe it's now closer to 150. So people have been signing up all morning. So brilliant. Uh, it's, it's amazing the number that, uh, that we've now got attending. Uh, due to the numbers that are attending, uh, then please adhere to the to the housekeeping rules. Uh, so uh, if you can keep yourself on mute, uh, and as Phil mentioned, if you do have any questions, if you can use the Q and A facility, or if you just want to make comments and a bit of banter, as Phil described it, then please use the chat to do so. Um, we will try and re uh, respond to every question that you uh, arise, um, whether it's there and then or whether we come back to you. So um, that's our, our, our pledge to respond to questions. The agenda today is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm doing this brief introduction. I'm then going to pass over to Phil, uh, who's going to facilitate a panel discussion with the very well-known and respected Rebecca Bennyworth. 
Uh, Rebecca has not only been running her own accountancy practice for 35 years, uh, she's a tax lecturer on the CPD circuit, uh, which she's been doing for 30 years. Um, she also openly loves, uh, admits to loving tax. Uh, and I suspect that means that she, uh, she's talking about the tax system rather than actually paying tax. Uh, well, then, at uh, 11 o'clock, we're going to hear from our very own Lee Bennett, uh, who's going to talk to us about what value add should software provide. Uh, and then we'll be wrapping up around 11.30. So, Phil, over to you. Thanks, Matt. And, and like Matt said, right, so we, uh, I think there's no, um, I don't need to do too much of an introduction uh, for who Rebecca is, because I think everyone uh, is, is pretty aware. But for those of you who aren't um, our guest today, is a distinguished tax expert who brings over three <laughs> decades of experience in tax consultancy. And in fact, is one of the most highly respected and sought after authority on all things tax related. Um, she's a regular speaker on industry events, has published numerous articles in tax journals as an, and is a regular commentator on tax matters in the media. Most recently, and most, most famously maybe, for, for appearing on the Martin Lewis show um, last <laughs> yeah. year, uh, which was brilliant. I, I <clears throat> tuned in for that one. I mean, I tuned in for them all. But um, So her vast knowledge and expertise has earned her the reputation of being one of the most respected tax experts in the UK. So we're thrilled to welcome Rebecca Bennywell here today to share her insights and expertise with us. Rebecca, welcome to this call. How are you today? Thanks, Phil. Um, I'm, I'm well. Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm coughing well, but that's the hangover <laughs> from a, a ghastly chest infection that started in, as all counters will sympathise with, the last week in January. And um, it's, it's dregs are still hanging around, but still. Wow. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well, really, yeah. I like it when you said a hangover, and I was just thinking you were just going to stop there. It's a cough. No, a hangover. It's <laughs> no, no. no. If, I, if I have a hangover this morning, it was from being in the office till ten o'clock last night oh. because uh, I I've had a bit of a busy few few days. So, um, but uh, no, I'm I'm bright and breezy, and I I was looking forward actually to coming down to Bristol and getting out of the office for a change because. <laughs> The last three years have really changed my life. Um, I've been, I've lived in hotels for, of that 30 years, 28 of them or whatever. And now all of a sudden, all I do is talk to a computer, which is very, very strange, but still. Um, yeah. It's it safe on the driving, but I do miss getting out and meeting people. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I think I'm, I'm a big fan of, um, I'm a big fan of going, going out and meeting people. I, we were recording a podcast for our Practice Evolution podcast um, last week. And we were talking to a couple of event organisers and we were discussing like the like what it was like post-COVID to go out and actually meet people. And actually, the accounting industry is, is often is the pioneer in things within the UK. We were one of the first events in the UK, first trade events in the UK, regardless of industry, to run after COVID. So... Um, it was kind of it was a fascinating time, but yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. I'm I'm a big fan. So look, I'm going to because um, probably the one question that everyone has and everyone always has um, is around the kind of the I always call it the elephant in the tax room, which is the MTD for ITSA, right? So I'm going to open up with this big question because I think this is always the one that everyone wants to ask, um, and us as vendors, we're probably the same, right? So so the first question. Um, can you share any insight that you've got on MTD for ITSA? Um, and I guess, I guess, will it ever happen? And if so, kind of the change and shape in remit. And this isn't all going to be a, a chat about MTD for ITSA, but I no. figured we'll get this out of the way and then we'll go on to the other. isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, to, the, to the question, will it ever happen? Absolutely, Phil. Absolutely. Without doubt, I would stake my life on it. I, I'd go further than that. Um, it absolutely will happen because it's got to happen and if we if we go back and i i will read between the lines uh, these are things i don't know but these are things that i surmise or suspect hmrc absolutely has to replace a lot of very aged hardware and the most aged is now being gently pensioned off, which is the VAT mainframe. But there's a lot of other hardware and, and indeed software systems that just need to go and have a lie down because they've been around for such a long time. Um, and I think the cost of that was pretty terrifying 
And in the days probably of austerity, because I think it probably does go back to Osborne, goes back to about 14, 15-ish, um, I think somebody decided they had to give a chancellor a carrot in order for them to release substantial amounts of money to do that. And I think um, certainly when I met Making Tax Digital, it was called Making Tax Simpler. And I met it for the first time with, from one of the policy chaps uh, at uh, either Treasury or HMRC, came along to a group I'm a member of, the Admin Burdens Advisory Board, and he talked about this new making tax simpler. And funnily enough, I had just had a bloke in to repair a, a computer in the office, and we'd found him locally through, I don't know, Yellow Pages, whatever, and he arrived and he did what he did, and then he said, who should I make the invoice out to? And he stood there with his mobile phone. This was 2015. And he typed in and he said, the invoice is in your inbox. He said, I can take payment now. And I went, cool, oh, that's good. Uh, and I don't know what software he was using, but within about a week, I went to this meeting and they were talking about digital records, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, this is fantastic. This bloke, this bloke has just repaired my computer, should talk to these guys, because it's going to be great. And I think what they did is they, they then latched onto that as a way of generating extra tax revenue, as they say, uh, because of inaccuracies of records. And every accountant listening, whether now or whether seven, eight years ago, will say there are clients and there are people we don't represent that keep appalling records and don't pay the right amount of tax. They probably pay too little, but actually a lot of accountants would argue, well, it's going to be a bit 50-50. So they sold it on extra tax revenue. But the reason for it was to replace the IT systems. And that reason has only got eight years older. So absolutely, it is going to happen. The new system is there. It is working forwards. It has proved a hell of a lot more complicated than I think anybody anticipated. And hence the delays. I mean, we were originally going to do NTD for it's the first. Um, and then they switched on to that in June 17. That was a really good call. Um, but I think having done that, they thought MTD it's a, would be similar. And it's not at all. I mean, as you guys know, it's such so much more complicated. A tax return is nothing like a VAT return. So, yes, it will come. What will it change? For me, I've, I have, in anticipation of MTD, I have completely re-engineered my practice. There probably isn't anything I do the same anymore. Um, and I think... Accountants can benefit from this. I mean, you know, I'm actually shipping out tax returns now. I've got probably half a dozen teed up ready to go. And if it hadn't been Easter, it probably would have been more because I've got my clients on digital records and I'm chasing them and saying, right, can I have your mileage or whatever? And then I can get your tax return filed. Then we can see what your tax is due in July. So it will change everything. Um, and I think not necessarily for the worst. I've certainly, my practice has benefited from the preparations that I've made for MTD. Um, so I look forward to it. When in 2015, you, you probably know, Phil, I'm on the programme board for uh, H, with HMRC for MTD. And I've, I do give a lot of time to the project. In 2015, I said I would give them a day a week. In 2021, I said, uh, for five years, in 20, 2021, I, or 2020, I said, right, you can have another five years, never dreaming. <laughs> By the end of that, it probably still wouldn't be delivered. <laughs> um, but but um, I just hope I'll still be active enough into my 70s, which is when it will be, that I can still help steer this project to land. I'm not going to be around for corporation tax because that's going to be over the other side of the next decade. But um, 
MTD, it's, uh, I would really like to hang on and try and help them deliver it. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think, I think I like the point you make about you, it, it's changed the way you run your practice. I did laugh though when you called it, originally it was called Making Tax Simpler. I think yeah. probably everyone, everyone, be it vendor or accountant, probably giggled at that. Um, I think probably changing that name was uh, was well was well placed. Um, but it's interesting how you you adapted your practice. I guess I guess there's a lot of fatigue, right? Like there's a lot of fatigue with HMRC delivering deadlines, messages. Yeah. Saying, da, 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 da. If uh, what I see a lot, and I've seen for the last couple of years, and I can only imagine it's going to get worse now. Is people now saying, well, actually doing the opposite to you, or saying, well, actually if it isn't going to come soon and if they're going to keep pushing out why should i bother changing what i do so my question to you is why should people bother changing if the legislation's not there today or tomorrow what advantages are there for an accountant and the accounting practice okay i'll start by asking people who say that whether they enjoy january um because because <laughs> actually you know, we won't ever make January go away, but what we can do is make it a lot easier. And, and do you know, if I'm, if I'm completely frank, some of it is our own fault because there are things that we could chase quicker and we could do um, and we don't until flipping January is upon us and then we have to go and scream at clients and things like that. But I think there are, for me... There are there are a couple of issues that cause January or in my small practice, and I've only got a very small practice. Um, so there are a couple of issues. There are clients failing to keep records and then not being able to deliver the records because they haven't written them up yet and they haven't found their other three bank statements and they haven't sat and had a think about how many miles to invent and all that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, and, and the longer it, the more late it is, the worse it is because you've forgotten more and now you've lost two of the bank statements that you had. So, so there's that. And then there's the, um, there's the sort of, I don't know, there's the sort of inertia that, that sort of lays over everything until it gets really, really desperate. What putting my clients on digital records has done, and I will freely admit, although I try to advertise myself as 100% digital, I do have some digital refusers of all ages, not just very elderly, but some of moderate, certainly a lot younger than me, but who just don't want to do digital. But for those, and limited companies absolutely have to go on to digital cloud-based records, I'm not into desktop, send me a disc or a memory stick. No, I want to be able to go in at any point. And what we do, we have what is usually termed daily bookkeeping. So I've got two members of staff who work on bookkeeping. They both work from home. They've both got very small children. In fact, I think today they're having a bit of a get together and working and putting the two little babies on the floor together and hoping they don't rip each other to shreds while the two mums sit together <laughs> doing some a big cis reconciliation for me. Um, <clears throat> but every single day the bookkeeping is done, the queries are chased up. Or the clients are phoned to say, you haven't uploaded your receipts, I'm coming to get them. And that way, by the time I get to April, May, I know that for most clients, it's all fully up to date. There might be a couple of query transactions sitting there and I can just pick through and go, right, I'm going to do those five this week and get those shipped out. And obviously, I do sensibly, I focus on people where... I might want to reduce payments on account, but I'm not sure I believe them that their turnover's down or whatever. Um, and I, I do that. But the essence of it is that we are up to date. So we're not begging for records and they're done as we go. So if someone wants a reference for a mortgage, I've got the figures um, and the receipts are captured as we go. So we're not going... Googling. I mean, I must admit, I said this, I was at a big conference and I said, you know, you get a bank payment and it's, oh, I wonder what this is for, Googling away, trying to work out what it is. And we don't do that either. 
and it just has made life so much easier. It's enabled me to move over to fixed pricing. It's enabled me to bill. I don't bill monthly. And clients say to me, oh, can't you bill the same amount every month? And I say, no, we bill when we've done the work. So we bill for VAT clients. We bill quarterly. When the VAT return has been submitted, they get the bill. Everybody else gets quarterly bills if they're on the software that covers software, payroll, whatever else we've done in that quarter. And then they get a bigger bill when the accounts and the tax return have been filed. And that's the way we do it. It's just a personal preference. But and it means I'm not handling client money. And I'm also not lazy where I'm just billing a flat amount every month. I'm keeping on it and I'm and I'm reviewing how much time is it taking to do this? Do I need to go back to the client and say, do you know what? You've got a lot more transactions than you had a year, two years ago. We're going to have to increase the bookkeeping charges. Yeah. And actually, I did that and a client went absolutely fair. You know, and, and so we're much more in touch with it. Now, I can do that as a small practice. If I was a partner in a 10 partner firm, there's absolutely no yeah. way I would have that level of insight. Um, but it, you know, it works for me. And actually, I've got two of my kids working for me, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, uh, just a side point. Um, I guess, I guess, googling what what certain transactions on bank statements is could be a very, very dangerous road to go. <laughs> 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 well, I've got I've got one client who will not have a separate business bank account. It's all in together, and I keep saying to him. I do not want to see what you buy your girlfriend for Christmas. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brilliant. So look, I think that I think that's some really good points, right? Like I think you, you say it really well. Like, does any accountant enjoy January? And I think I think very few, very few would, would I, I wish I could do a poll mid-webinar because the poll I would do right now would be, you know, in fact, look, let, let's do it in the chat, right? We've got uh, uh, well over a hundred people here. Um, just put a yes or a no in the chat if you enjoy January. Um, yeah. So in the chat, just do a Y or an N if you enjoy. I want to see if any yeses come through. So <laughs> me, Lee Hall, first one come up. Uh, Jamie, no. <laughs> Melissa, no. Caroline, no, 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 no. There's a lot of no's. I'm not seeing no. <laughs> not seeing so, so I think you, you're right. No one does, right? Yeah, if we, go, if we go back to a question, why should you put people on digital records? Oh, Michael. You yeah, level you. <laughs> Stephen <laughs> Williams. Yes, yes, it makes it for people who, who need pressure to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm I I did. I will admit, I did start putting people on digital records because I thought MTD for instance was coming in about 2017. Yeah. So I started. However, however, um, now. Provided they they can afford the um, they can afford the the fees and and Phil you know I have done what some of the sole practitioners on here have done I've done I have piles of paper because the client doesn't have records all I've got is a, is a carrier bag and yeah. it's not even a Tesco bag anymore it's a blimmin' little bag or an Aldi bag because of the cost of living and. It's just piles of paper. I don't want to do that. That isn't what I studied for. So, you know, by getting them on digital records, you get shot of all of that. You know, I almost beg them to join their bank account to my product that I use because, you know, and actually, do you know, the first couple of clients I put on, their accounts were so messy that even taking into account the fee they were paying for the for the software, their annual bill went down. Their annual bill went down because I wasn't wading through piles of CRAP. Yeah. You know, so. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I, I know, I know exactly what you mean. It's, it's, it's. Yeah, it's it's far easier. So look, um, we, we've kind of covered off uh, MTD. I think we've got lots yep. of... I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't start asking some questions around tax rights. Right? I'm sure that's what a lot of people were here to, to listen to as well. So um, I guess my first question is um, practical hints and tips, right? So tax laws and reg legislation change all the time. It's very complex. And as someone that, that's more software than accountancy, 
I try to keep on top of it. And quite often I'm like, I get a little bleary eyed. I'm just like, oh, it's very complicated. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure everyone on this call uh, and, and, and listening will, will be far more um, kind of up to date than that. But still, it's still hard to keep up to date with. So what tips would you give for people staying up to date with the changes in tax laws and, and regulations so they're not missing stuff, so they're not getting caught out? And also, how can they easily digest that to their team that might not have that complex knowledge that they do? Mm. <clears throat> Bill, that's, <clears throat> that's a, a really difficult question to answer without saying, come on, my courses. And, and you know, it doesn't make any difference <laughs> to me. I, I get paid. I get paid to rock up. If there's 2,000 people there, the provider makes a big profit. If there's 200, they make less profit. But, um, and it isn't, it isn't always the best way. I mean, one of the things is to recognise and to understand how you personally learn. And for those in charge of a team is to understand how they learn because they will learn in different ways. Um, and a good presenter will quite often present something complex using a variety of techniques, using a, a practical example, using a diagram, using slides with words on. So there's that type of thing. But also, do you learn, do you learn by hearing about it and then reflecting on it for quite a long time and then maybe going back to it and cementing that knowledge. My husband was that type of learner. My husband was a, a brilliant man. Um, uh, he, he worked as an actuary. He, I met him at university. And part of me used to think, oh, he's so thick, because he doesn't get it like that, which is how I learn. I get that much knowledge really, really fast. And then I have to spend time to go deeper. But he, he can't even get the superficial or couldn't even get the superficial bit quickly. So I think it's, it's doing a little bit of self-analysis and understanding how you learn and then adapting what you do and how you try to uh, um, uh, accumulate this knowledge um, to suit your way of learning. You know, do you do a bit and skim read it and know your brain's half on it, but you're just getting the sort of feel of it and then go back to it tomorrow and go into it in more detail. Now, the other, the other bit that's hard about that question, Phil, is I know myself. And one of the reasons that I started lecturing and I initially, I was a, a training manager with a medium sized firm before I left up my family when I went self-employed. So I started my practice when my, uh, when my first child was born. Um, so actually that now makes it 36 and a half years, but that's about right. And I then did a little bit of student training and I then started to get into CPD. And the, and the, and the reason I started to get into CPD training is I was forgetting everything. And as much as I was trying to read a currency magazine or taxation magazine or whatever, it wasn't going in. And the fear of standing up in front of people without absolutely knowing everything about it made sure that I got absolutely to grips with absolutely everything before I stood up and said anything. And Fosia said, they do say the best way to learn is to teach. You know, I absolutely have to be all over the subject. Um, and actually, it's why, although I'm sort of thinking about how oh, I need to cut down, it's why I will keep lecturing and keep doing a certain number of lectures, because that way I absolutely know, you know, I could, I could quote you, well, I could certainly quote you how many clauses are in the finance bill and how many clauses are on, uh, uh, it's 478 pages, by the way, <laughs> 43 clauses on income, co- income corporation and capital gains tax. Um, because there'll, be I, someone, there'll be someone on this call checking that right now. You yeah, know yeah, that, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 478 is the number of pages in the PDF. There's actually 458 or 57 of actual legislation. But 
that's what I spent all day yesterday doing. I sat at my desk at nine in the morning and I finished at 10 o'clock at night and I was on the finance bill. Now, there is no way. If I was a practitioner, there's no way I would have been doing that. I might have been doing a couple of fat returns that are due on the 7th of May or I might have been sitting out in my garden in the sunshine, but I certainly wouldn't have been slaving over a finance bill. So it, it, it is difficult. You know, there are courses, there are videos. I... I worry as a trainer that the new Vogue for online, I know probably what I'd do. I'd keep meaning to watch the video back because I got a call in the middle of the course. And, you know, I feel I remember so clearly a chap came up to me in um, just south of my, in Altrincham on a course years ago. He came up to me at the end and very quietly he said to me, What's Form 42? Now, Form 42, we don't hear of it much, but uh, when it came in, it was quite a drama, and it's to do with issue of shares to uh, members of staff and that. And it had been in about two years, and I'd mentioned it in passing. And I looked at him, and I went, it's to do with employee shares. And he said, I've never heard of it. I said, how have you never heard of it? And he said, well, I've been a bit busy and I haven't been on any courses for about 18 months. He said, I'm now absolutely terrified I've incurred penalties for clients because I haven't heard of it. You know, and you imagine the new CGT reporting form. Now, there's been enough moaning about it that you probably would have caught wind of it. But what if you hadn't been on a course for a couple of years and you didn't know about it and you completely missed it? I'll tell you how you'd find out. You'd be getting clients knocking on your door saying, I've had a letter from HMRC telling me I've disposed of a property and I haven't filed a form and it's now two years late. Yeah. So the penalty is going to definitely run into thousands. So as a question of this, um, so I've got a friend who is a solicitor. We were talking about CPD not that long mm -hmm. ago and he was saying how like it's relaxed so much now that like listening to, listening to a podcast or you know, reading a newspaper, I don't think it's quite that bad, can now be qualified as, as CPD. And he fears that there's a dumbing down in CPD, which means ultimately, because it's got less strict, that the value of it is less. And therefore, people are not putting, people are treating it as something that just has to be done as a tick box, rather yeah. than actually like what you're saying is a valuable way of staying on top of the legislation. Is that is that a fair assessment that it, it's in some areas it's dumbing down a little bit? I, I think, Phil, my experience over 30 years in the game uh, is that actually not a huge amount has changed. And the reason I say that is I've stood at reception desks on courses, CCH courses in the old days, and watched people come, sign the sheet, pick up the notes and walk back, sneak back out the door. Um, I was doing one up in Glasgow, CCH course, and uh, I was doing one up in Glasgow and the fire alarms went off. It was, I think, about five minutes before coffee break. Oh, I was going across the car park, getting in their cars, thinking, <laughs> right, you're out. <laughs> I was going, come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think there is, and when you're busy, I completely understand, but yeah. I... I would, if I stopped being on top of it, I would close my practice without doubt, even though it's a really small practice and I actually don't get a lot of technical tax, I would make mistakes and I would absolutely not. And really, you're right, but if people are going to be lazy about CPD, they'll be lazy whatever the rules are. If the rules say you've got to be yeah. signed into this many courses, they'll sign in. Doesn't mean they've attended, paid attention, done anything you know i've seen people sitting at the back going through a working papers file nowadays it'll be on their laptop and i can't see what they're doing um you know and that's the way it is i i i think the raid the icaw raid process i've forgotten what it raid, uh, review assess something um was assess what CPD you need to do and then find appropriate resources. I think it's an intelligent way of carrying on, but even the ICAW is now going back to a mandatory number of hours per year that you've got to do. Um, but you're right, you know, I mean, I think they're going, 
used to be the term used to be structured and unstructured. Yes. Structured was courses, unstructured was reading, accounts, mag or whatever. Um, I think they're going a little bit more sophisticated than that. And they're going to be using really quite clever modern tools to support it. But um, I don't know. I think the CPD market is, is in a bit of a pickle, really. Yeah. Um, I, and I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm going to be too old to care in a few years. <laughs> you're, you're right, though. I think, I think it, whilst online learning is definitely the vogue and that's a hangover from COVID and it's, it's more efficient use of time, right, because you're, you're not losing the travel time, but also what you're not gaining is is the interaction and yeah. that so, so, certainly more attention. And I know when I do it, um, you know, in a regulatory, any regulatory business, and I've been in them for years, we have to do regulatory training. And, you know, can a video be played in the background whilst you're doing something else? Yes, it can. Do I do that? Of course I don't. Um, but I'm sure some people do. So look, um, I guess you, 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 you may it's an interesting point you made about like if people are sloppy approaching CPD, they'll be sloppy approaching work. Right. Which, which brings me to a question that I want to ask you about mistakes and common mistakes you see. So what are some of the common mistakes that you see accountants making when it comes to tax, tax preparation and compliance? Well, do you know, I don't, I don't see, and I don't, have insight into what they're doing in their office i know what questions they ask me on courses um and it's lovely when in the old days somebody come up ask me a question i've had a bit of a think and i've said well why don't you try this approach usually about having an argument with hmrc <laughs> and then a year later they'll come up and say that works thank you very much it's brilliant you know that's that's lovely um I know when I pick up clients, sometimes I cringe. I am not a one, and I never ever will be a one who says, right, let's sue your previous advisor. But I I do um I do look at some clients and think, what were they thinking of? Um, you know, just really basic advice that I can't believe that nobody would give, you know, I look at it and I think, why didn't they say something to her? And I might say to the client, you know, did your accountant say anything about this? Oh no, I think, okay. You know, maybe I'm doing a disservice by saying, well, you should sue them. They've cost you a lot of money, um, but they're compliant. It's just that they haven't had the best advice. And, and, um, so, you know, things, traps for the unwary. Do you know, Phil, it's usually admin. When I get people coming on to me and saying, you know, oh, right, well, we've got this issue and it's going to go to law, whatever. It's usually dropping the ball. It's forgetting a return. It's, you know, not realising that there is a new CGT 30-day, 60-day reporting rule, Um for some, I mean, this CGT return is a really, really good illustration because for some uh, accountants, they knew it's there, they know it's there, but they don't realise their clients made a disposal until they get the papers in to do the tax return in maybe December, and then they find there's a CGT disposal and we haven't done the return because the client didn't tell us. I would... I would prefer to be more proactive so that any of my clients who've got buy-to-let properties, whether they're a residential or whether they're a furnished holiday let, I, I told them, if you are thinking about selling, when you accept an offer, you need to contact me because then I can actually deal with it. And I've got quite good links with a couple of firms of solicitors around here now to say, and I think solicitors are being a little bit more proactive, but it did catch a lot of people out early days. Ated return, Fosia said, is another one clients forget to tell us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these funny little things that happen outside of a corporation tax or an income tax return, they're the danger areas, really. Um, yeah. I think my final, my, I've got a tip really, which is if you're dealing with something that you've only got one of, and in the old days it was pension scheme audits, charity audits, that's the really old days, 
And I would always say if somebody, because I used to lecture on that many years ago, I always used to say, if you've only get, if you've only got one pension scheme, get rid of it because you'll never get any good at it. And at some point you'll make a mistake. Don't have one of anything. Um, I don't act for trusts. I don't get involved in trusts. Um, and that way, because I, because I've never had any, I don't have practical experience of it. I won't teach it and I won't, you know, I mean, obviously I understand the stuff in the books, but I don't do it in real life. And that's something I've certainly always kept to when I'm, when I'm lecturing is I will only talk about stuff that I actually really know because I've done it as opposed to what's in the legislation. Now, when the legislation is brand new, obviously nobody's done it, yeah. but you know, I, that's the, that's the attitude I've taken. Yeah. That's a, that's a really, really interesting point. Actually only doing, only doing kind of only teaching what you know and, 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 and talking about what you know. So I've got quite a good, quite, I've got quite a good load of questions coming in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause my questions and come over to some of our Q and a. Um, so the first one, um, is from Fozia, uh, who's always super interactive in the chat, so thank you, Fozia. So tax changes upcoming. The one that I am worried about, because I hate doing many years ago, and I think there will be mistakes, is on the CT, CT Associated Companies oh, Marginal oh. Tax Relief. <laughs> so any tips you can give on, 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 on that one? Um, well, first tip is, and I don't know, but I guess if I dug around, I could get the syllabus. I don't. I think you could well have qualified accountants of various flavours in your practice who have never been taught this. So first thing is when you've got junior and not quite so junior members of staff dealing with limited company files, um, they need <clears throat> they need some real, real careful review, training and careful review before they do the corporation tax returns this year. So that, that's number one. Number two, this stuff is absolutely vile. And you've got to do a really, really clear fact find, and you've got to keep that up to date. And it's something that probably the fee doesn't cater for. Because you've got to find out, is this individual owning shares in any other companies it, companies we don't act for nothing to do with us but they've got some shares in another company and if they have is there you know i mean it isn't just a right on shareholding it's a right on distributable profits it's a right on winding up it's a connection through brothers um through parents through spouse civil partner so there is such a big fact find that it is really, really challenging. But the first thing is for everyone listening to make sure, because lots of people will have done this last time we had multiple rates of CT, is to get your knowledge up to date. Now, HMRC have updated the manuals, um, but lots and lots of presenters are doing intensive stuff on associated companies, I'm certainly being asked to do it just about every time I open my mouth, I'm being asked to do associated companies. Um, and um, it is find some courses, go on more than one from more than one presenter, because you might pick up a different slant of it. But um, yeah, it is. You are right to be nervous about it. It is terrifying. OK, um, sure. There's a lot of. Um, sure it's uh, a lot of people are nervous about that one so uh, one from jamie um hi rebecca it's a long shot but may i ask if there is a solution to rti duplication of employee when they move accountants because right. it causes duplication of paye paye issues other than raising a dispute with hmrc right yeah because you're moving probably you're moving software now i will say i will say my my initial, my first answer is a bit of a cop out. And that is when we take clients on, we try and make sure that the old accountant does the payroll up to the end of March. So I took a client on from the, yeah, yeah, it's what folks here said. I took a client on from the end of February, but I said, I'm not taking the payroll on until April. Um, but 
I know that um, my my daughter runs all my payrolls. I must ask her because she has seemed to be able to navigate this and she does payroll for me, but she also does payroll for a much, much bigger firm who are quite acquisitive and therefore taking on clients all the time. So she's obviously got a, a, a tried and tested method. I know there is some stuff on HMRC's guidance pages about things to do and watch when, you, I mean, obviously everyone knows don't give them a new employee number. Um, but um, I think there are some tips, but yeah, otherwise raising a dispute with HMRC. I mean, it leads me to another thing, Phil, the, dis the, the, dis the difference between what HMRC can see and has on their system and what we file is actually driving us all insane. And I know that there's a lot of activity going on between the rep bodies, so the ICA, WACCA, CIT and whatever, and HMRC, trying to find a way through this absolute flipping jungle where they can't see what we can see. But not only that, their system looks like, you know, an old fashioned piece of software that somebody's a, a four year old has got into and started working out how to post journals by just banging a keyboard. You know, it's a bit like the chimpanzees churning out Shakespeare. <laughs> when you look at it, it's like terrifying. What? <laughs> There's money going backwards and forwards, interest charges that shouldn't be there. Um, it is a really big problem, and, and certainly it, I know it takes up a huge amount of my daughter's time. Yeah, that's interesting. So on the subject of HMRC, um, a couple more questions. I'm going to combine Mike. Mike has got two questions. I'm going to combine them following to one. Less questions, more statements, I think. Um, but Mike asks, why is it necessary, necessary for accountants and tax keepers to become unpaid servants of HMRC? And is it HMRC's raison d'etre now just to raise... Um, finances via uh, penalties um, and is, is that so he said would you agree that the system is now penalty orientated in particular for missed deadlines so I'm guessing Mike's not the, the biggest fan of, um, of HMRC. Fan. no, no <laughs> I, I can understand um, okay accountants and tax advisors becoming unpaid servants of HMRC is what we signed up for a little bit you know I mean, even, I go back to the old days, and probably back even before Mike, although he probably is, sounds as if he's got experience in the old system, you know, with even with estimated assessments, big A3 sheets of paper and appeals to the commissioners and all of that, uh, paper tax returns, preceding year basis. Even then, what I signed up for when I went into practice was making sure that my clients paid the right amount of tax at the right time. And that's what we do now. It's just, it's, there's more to it. There's more taxes, ATED, CGT returns, whatever. But actually my job is to take the load of tax compliance away from my clients. Oh, 9.30, Stephen. Yeah. All right then. Um, uh, take that load away from my clients and to do that as effectively and efficiently as I can with the ultimate objective that is both mine and HMRC's is that your client pays the right tax at the right time and nothing else. Now we can get into a debate about tax avoidance and all of that, but this, that's not my bag, that's not my flavour. Going on, is HMRC penalty oriented? Not it looks like it. I agree, it looks like it. But when you talk to the top people, they will say very openly, and, and particularly Jim Harrow, the permanent secretary, I don't want your penalty, I just want the return. Give me the return. I don't want to penalise you. But what I, what I will add to that is, there are still some areas, and I will not go off on my hobby horse of high income child benefit charge. There are still, still some areas where, in my view, bad design, bad communication, poor understanding of their obligations by taxpayers, 
leads to penalties. And it is not that people are deliberately non-compliant. There are some. It is not. It is that they didn't realise they needed to do X. They therefore failed to do X. And I think there should be much more of an attitude in HMRC at the sort of middle level of staff of ascertaining that and not penalising them and retaining the penalties for the deliberate. Now, sometimes it's difficult to tell, but when you see an appeal against late tax return by uh, penalties of hundreds of pounds, thousands, by a homeless person, you realise there's something wrong by, in the people who made the decision to pursue that case. Yeah. That is wrong. Now, the new penalty system is a lot more forgiving. And, you know, one of the reasons to get MTD on with it is that £100 immediate penalty will go. That will be gone. You will get a penalty point if you are late with your return. But if you get the next two in on time, you will never see a penalty. You'll be able to do a late return once every three years without even an excuse. And you will never see a penalty. And that is the culture that is emerging. But some of the old culture I disagree with. I think it is, I think it is a failing by HMRC if lots of people get penalties because they are failing to make clear what people's obligations are and to encourage them to meet them. Yeah, I think... I think that's a great, I think that's a really good point, right? Like, like a system that a system that's so complicated that you get fines because you don't understand what your obligations are is wrong. Yep. Fine for people that just can't be bothered to do something on time yep. is correct. Because yes. that, that puts pressure on you, on HMRC, on everyone. If everyone just kind of did what they needed to do and un but understood that. I mean, I've got I always have an issue with tax code of HMRC. My tax code changes so regularly. I phone them up. I try to get an explanation for it. And I could be phoning the Swahili government support line for, for how much I understand what I'm told. And you ask them, say, is there a possible way of dumbing this down a little bit so I can understand? And then they try and dumb it down. And you're like, yeah, I still don't understand it. But thanks for your time. And then I just take whatever they tell me. And, and I think it is a very complex system. Um, and it has very complex applications. Uh, if, people, if laymen, I always say at work, one of the things I always say to my colleagues at work is if you give me a report and it's not like really simple, high level, I'm probably not going to understand it because it's not how my brain's wired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, I've got a couple more questions um, before we finish. Um, right. Before you say that, Phil, let me just let me just give a little... What I am desperate to get Martin Lewis Money Show to do is to do a whole programme on tax codes. Yes. I will do it so you understand it, Phil. I will. Um, but at the moment, I, you know, um, I've got to wait for the call. I can't, you know, I don't yeah. know Martin as Martin. So <laughs> <laughs> well, Maybe we should tweet him. Maybe everyone that's on here, let's tweet Martin Lewis and say... And everyone that's listening um, on demand, let's tweet my list and say, get Rebecca back on to do a show on tax codes. Because actually, do you know what? Again, like I know I'm the, our audience here is, is predominantly accountants and you'd expect that majority of people on this call will have an understanding of that broadly because of their wider knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, if you ask your family, your friends, how often do we really genuinely understand what we're told? And the answer is, I think, and I'm, I'm you know, not I'm further I'm closer to 50 than I am to 40 now right so I'm getting older and I you think by right now it'd be something that I'd understand but but apparently not so I guess another good question that, that, that kind of came up when we were looking at this um we've talked about HMRC a lot and and kind of the complexity what hints and tips would you give to the people on this the people listening today around dealing with HMRC because obviously you probably know them better than most so how can we make that relationship with less friction? Okay, um, here, are, here are some of the things I do. I don't phone HMRC unless there is absolutely no other way to resolve it. And sometimes the other way to resolve it is just wait and see if it falls out. Um, it's frustrating. Uh, if I do phone HMRC, somebody gave me a tip. Who was it? I don't know. Somebody said to me, 
A, ring the ADL about um, about uh, half four in the afternoon because all the new bods have gone home by then and you get the old lags who know stuff, um, which I don't know whether it's true, but I must admit if I ring, I ring between half past four and half past five and I quite often get an intelligent answer. I mean, that's one of the frustrating things is if and when you do get through, particularly on ADL, and I'll come back to ADL in a second, but if and when you do get through, you'll quite often get it sorted on the call. Um, the next thing I do is if you are in a bit of a to and fro with HMRC, number one, read the manual carefully on it, on the subject that you're talking about. Not because it's the law, because it isn't, but it is HMRC's view. And remember, the manuals are there to tell staff what to look at, what to look at, what questions to ask. And I had a big tax inquiry years and years ago, and I went through every single page of the manual, and we prepared with the client an answer to absolutely everything. And when we had the meeting, they claimed my client's premises, it was a farm. Uh, two of them came, a <laughs> little bit disgruntled because it was muddy in the yard, surprise, surprise. Uh, and um, we we knocked it on the head that day because we answered every single question because we knew what they were going to be. Um, and then finally, offer solutions. So if you're writing to say blah, 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 and you think that there is a way around this that complies with the law, you might say, well, um, my suggestion is that we go down this route and you might reference that with a statutory reference or a manual reference for this reason, because if you just leave them trying to work out what to do next, it will take a long time. If you offer them a, a palatable solution that seems to be sensible, they're pretty likely to take it because they're not going to have to then go off and work out, well, where do we go with this next? So there are a, a few little ideas about, about dealing with um, dealing with HMRC. Let me just come back to that ADL. At the moment, the ADL is restricted. And the reason the ADL is restricted is because HMRC are getting a lot of calls. And it, it occurs to me that a lot of those calls are from taxpayers who don't understand their tax code. Yeah, 100%. Uh, you know, and... There you go. If they did, then. Oh, Phil, you've gone on mute. I have. You're right. Uh, it was only a matter of time, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it? It's the same argument as, you know, if you if you improve education, you improve you improve health care and you improve. And therefore, everything becomes less of an issue because yeah. you're starting with the root cause that people understand. You know, it, it's the same thing if you solve the basic problem that takes up the majority of your time, then the rest of your time is free for the complex. I love those tips. Call after 4.30 and be solution focused. I love that because it's what I always say to my daughter, be solution focused. You'll come to me with a problem, like be solution focused. So um, I've got one last question. Um, and it's, it's kind of a little bit around the software side of things, right? So the software, in the time you've been in the industry, the software market has moved considerably, right? The tools that are available now are exponentially better, I guess, I, I would I would say, than maybe even what they were years ago, and they keep evolving. Um, but they're evolving at pace. And, and so I guess it, it's a double question, really. What do you think accountants should look for in a software supplier and how do you and what advice would you give someone investing in software in the near future noting that that kind of we're only at the start of the evolution of where a lot of this software is going to be and you don't want to necessarily kind of you, you've got to make the right decision oh gosh phil that is really tough <laughs> and i i tussle with this in in my practice so on the tax side, I think you've got to be aware now of broadly where you think you're going to go with MTD, assuming you're not heading for retirement. And lots of accountants are. There is an age bump that are now going, right, 2016, I'll be out of here by then. Um, 
but you've got to think about the way you're going to go. And so here are a couple of sort of observations, not so much about supplier at the moment, but about, about what you're looking for. Under MTD, the plan is that HMRC will calculate the tax. I personally feel very, very uncomfortable about that. It's not that I don't trust um, HMRC, um, but I slightly don't in <laughs> terms of down the years they've been shown to have got tax calculations wrong and not in accordance with the law. Um, but, you know, what about all the, like, you know, do you want double tax relief as tax credit or do you want to report the income net of foreign tax and stuff like that? I quite often have to do what ifs um, and I'm not sure how that will work. So I think software needs to still be calculating tax. And for that reason, given how complex our tax code is, I would be looking for suppliers with a long history of providing tax software and not looking at new entrants. And that's a bit unfair on new entrants, but that amount of learning is something you can't replicate. And so I would be nervous personally of a brand new tax software company who has got no history in the UK uh, and who comes along and says, oh, we're gonna do this now. They might have done it by buying a small, long-standing tax software company, and therefore they've got that learned history. But that, that for me, that I think that's quite important. Um, and then integration, obviously, account software, uh, well, no, bookkeeping software, you need to be able to integrate. You need to be able to suck the data in because no, A, nobody wants to be keying it in. Under MTD with digital links, you won't be able to. And then you've got to think about what what else do you want it to do? Do you want it to do limited company accounts or will you buy a different product or a sister product? And then what about practice management? Do you want the same, you know, do you want to have to go into that software and tell it I've done that? Or do you want it, do you want to do it? And it will say, oh yeah, that's done. And and actually, I'm not saying integration is absolutely essential. But you need to think about, I mean, not that long ago, I managed all my deadlines with spreadsheets. And now my practice is growing. I absolutely cannot do that. Um, I've made a decision about managing my deadlines and practice management software. But I'm not using all the facilities of it. And, you know, it's sort of a toe in the water. And how far do I want to go? And where am I going with my tax software? And so it is really, really difficult. But I think the new entrants, particularly on bookkeeping, are interesting. Um, Fosia said, I hate changing lanes frequently on a motorway as there is a risk. Uh, you might get there faster, but you might have a bump. Yeah, um, this will be my first change attack software. I'm having to change because my supplier... Um, will not be supporting MTD. And I and I will say uh, I'm a director of the company. So um, we've made a decision. I'm approaching 70. Uh, there are two of us who actually sort of work on the product. I'm the tax bit. The programmer is over 70. Uh, and we're out of here because we've got to rewrite our product completely to do MTD. So we're not doing it. Um, but our corporation tax product is probably got still got quite a few years uh, years <laughs> like um but yeah um it is it is a toughie but i will be going with long-standing providers yeah i think that's uh, i think that's a really really good piece of advice look rebecca this has been a fascinating conversation and uh i'm 100 percent sure i could have spoken to you for another two hours uh and we would have got enough questions for it um so i just want to say thank you so much for joining us uh and thank you so much for giving up your time to talk about uh, everything from i mean we've covered off everything from uh mtd to hmrc to complicated <laughs> <laughs> so so lots and lots of bits in this. But look, Rebecca, thanks for joining. Um, and I'm going to hand back to Matt to introduce the next session. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much, Rebecca and Phil, for hosting. i um, fascinated, Rebecca, with um, the angle you took on Do You Enjoy January? Uh, the majority of 
the answers were unsurprisingly no. There were a few that were yes, which is uh, which is absolutely fine. Um, some of the points that you raised uh, was that we don't chase early enough. Um, so clients failing to keep their records, uh, not sending in their information, the longer you delay, the more is lost and forgotten. Um, before uh, this morning, I put together a few uh, points to link into the next session. Um, and um, from my experience, and I've been in the sort of the, the software industry and the accounting profession for approaching uh, 30 years now. So I see the, the typical pain areas that accountants uh, are experiencing is one is having to request data from clients and getting that data in, which is what you alluded to. Uh, it's then populating the software engines to create the required statutory output, be it accounts or tax. Uh, it's then getting approval and sign off uh, from the clients for the generated output. Um, and finally, getting the real-time business information that helps uh, accountants make instant business decisions based upon up-to-date information. Uh, so um, it, linking into that, what we want to now show you, and I'm going to hand over to Lee, is that um, we've got uh, over 2,500 customers using our solution, um, and we're going to show how our products can help in those areas. So it's it's the, the getting the data, um, populating of the engine without having to rekey that information in, getting approval, uh, and then giving you real-time information. So Lee's just in a very sum some aerial uh, uh, sort of 20 odd minutes is just going to show an overview of what we can do. Um, following that, um, at 11.30, we'll be uh, closing uh, the, this actual uh, seminar. Um, we will follow up at the end uh, with the recordings for everyone that's attended. Um, and if you do want to contact us following this, then our, our contact details will be on that same email as well. So, Lee, over to you. You've got about 20-odd minutes before we look to wrap up, 20, 25 minutes. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Okay, you should be able to see that now. So, let me start off by uh, introducing myself a little bit more. Uh, so, my name is Lee Bennett. I am Head of Pre-Sales at Waters Club. I've been with the company now for... Uh, almost nearly 24 years. So I've got a lot of experience in dealing with accountants. I was one myself back in the day. Um, and obviously now I've moved over to uh, support the sales team in the demonstration of our software solution. The screen that you're looking at at the moment is our core product that we call CCH Central. Its job is to bring together all of the data, all of the applications and all of the cross products functionality things like mail merge and reporting task management and workflow the actual screen that we're looking at at the moment is an example of a dashboard or as we call it a home page the idea hopefully quite uh, simple and easy to understand each individual member of the practice when they log into the software will have relevant information being displayed to them so this is my personal home page that i'm using at the moment just to pick out a couple of the areas that we can see on here. In the top left-hand corner, I've got a list of tasks and appointments. Um, specifically, those are the tasks that the system has automatically allocated to me by virtue of our workflow engine. So the system will know who needs to do what and when it needs to be done by. And in the top right-hand corner, I've got the uh, still 2022, I'm a little bit behind with my tax returns, uh, but 2022 filing status, and that's been driven um, directly from our personal tax um, system. The other items you can see on the homepage at the moment are more to do with practice management, so I'll probably skip over those today. But again, from an integrated point of view, we can see all of the information from different areas of the solution, depending on obviously what you're interested in. Now, I'm just going to show one more homepage, and then we'll get into the, the, the main focus of the, um, the, the demonstration, but I'm just going to show this particular homepage. I've called it Jobs in Progress. Effectively, that's what it's showing me. Uh, I guess more specifically, it's showing me the workflow engine. And uh, again, more specifically than that, the progress that I'm making in the production of my CCH personal tax returns. We can see at the top of the screen that I've still got 47 that are currently in progress. And I guess most like people would do, and Rebecca mentioned it again, that 
she would have done until quite recently, um, use some kind of Excel spreadsheet to manage uh, the jobs. Um, so we've designed this particular homepage to kind of mimic what most people would have done. Obviously, down the left-hand side, we can see a list of my clients. We've got direct access to the uh, tax returns themselves. You can see the hyperlinks there. And then we have a number of columns displaying the progress that we're actually making. In my case, I elected to show the dates that things have been completed or need to be completed by. But you can show icons, you can just show ticks uh, for the things that you have completed. Again, integration with the rest of the suites, we'll see some columns relating to budgets that have been set and also the actual time um, that's been spent on those tax returns uh, taken directly from the timesheets as part of our practice management software. And you'll notice that uh, where we're showing the name of the client and the tax year, they're blue, they're underlined, they act as hyperlinks uh, anywhere within the software. If you see one of those, just click on it, it takes you directly to the underlying information depending on what information is. Now the client I'm gonna be working on today is Mr. Jack Smith. So I'm just clicking on his client name there on the left hand side and it will take me directly to his client record as it appears within CSET Central for me as an individual user. One of the focus areas within our software is to always have a personalized and customized experience for each individual user. So I've designed my screen to work in the way that I want to work rather than me having to change necessarily my way of working to fit in with the software. The first thing that I want to know is where are we with all of the jobs, all of the things that we're doing for this particular client. So I'm taken directly to the overall workflow screen for this particular client. We can see that effectively we've got four things. My practice has got four things that are running at the moment and I can see uh, where are we, what the current step is, who each of those jobs is assigned to, and the deadline date for each. Uh, you will notice that they're all red, they're all overdue in my case. Now I'm just going to flick directly over to Accounts Production. You'll see Accounts Production just fits nicely within uh, the client record itself. So whatever task that needs to be carried out, um, it's only a, ever a click away. And again, you can change the position of the tabs as they appear within the clients. So if my main focus was to do the accounts for my clients, probably I'd move it over to the left-hand side and replace it with the workflow tab. Now, one of the areas that has already been spoken on quite heavily this morning is all around the digitalization of the practice, uh, whether it's to do with MTD, um, or whether it's just gathering the information, Matt just mentioned it as part of his little intro as well, whether it's gathering the information directly from your clients. So with that in mind, with accounts production, I'm just gonna go into my client's latest period, accounting period, and we'll see on the left-hand side, there's an option called sync with open integration and you'll see that it's in bold and it's got a number in brackets 255. Now open integration is a module of something that we have within CCH one click. CCH one click is our tool that we've developed to enable the digitalization of your practice. It's the link between our current software that we're looking at at the moment, so the accounts, the tax, the practice management, whatever it happens to be, the document management even, and third-party cloud-based systems. So I'm gonna be referring to the likes of uh, bookkeeping applications, and I'm gonna use Xero as, as an example, but others are available, obviously, and also directly out into HMRC, because they're gathering information that we might need to use as well, obviously as part of the tax return preparation. And also back to our clients. So once we've done all of this, we then need to send something to our clients. And again, I'm gonna use a tax return for their digital approval before we can get the system to uh, file it directly back to HMRC. So the sync with open integration, I've already gone ahead and uh, linked my client's record directly to zero. That 255 is basically telling me that there's 255 transactions currently sat in zero that don't exist within accounts production. And that's fairly obvious because we can see that my trial balance is pretty much empty, as we can see at the moment. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna bring in that information. Uh, I do have options to bring in all of those transactions or just a summary trial balance, but I'm gonna use the transactions. 
Now, because the zero chart of accounts is different from the CCH chart of accounts, we do need to apply a mapping. Can be customized, and again, for each uh, individual client. Each client may have different requirements on their charts. And you'll see that it will go through, synchronize my chart of accounts. It will then go ahead and synchronize the transactions. But actually, again, what you'll notice is that there are two types of transactions. We've got the ones that are imported, so effectively coming all the way from zero. And we do also have the ability to make any year-end transactions, any year-end adjustments that you probably will have to make, the likes of accruals and prepayments and depreciation. If you want to, you can send them back into zero. Uh, or any other kind of bookkeeping, certain bookkeeping applications, um, so that both ledgers effectively are always kept up to date. Now, if I just go back to my homepage on the left-hand side, you will see that I've got now a trial balance. Again, you'll notice that the codes on the left-hand side are all hyperlinked, so there's effectively all the transactions, the transactions that have been posted to uh, 0010, coming all the way from zero. From here, and I am going to skip a few points, obviously, um, the, the, for time purposes, but I can go directly then to my financial statements and I can then generate them on screen. I can print them to PDF, publish them to OneClick, which is effectively sending them directly to my clients for their approval or just because I want to send them a draft set for accounts um, or uh, directly save them into our document management system which again is held within CCA Central. But actually what I want to do now is take that information and combine it with other data with the preparation of my client's tax return. So again, just tax returns to sit nicely alongside accounts production, again, nicely within the uh, client window within CCA Central. If I go into the latest tax year that I've got at the moment, 2022, you'll see straight away that as soon as I got in there, I'm faced with an on-screen tax calculation. This tax calculation is completely live. So as any transaction is entered or even started to be entered, that data and that tax calculation will automatically recalculate itself. Now, you may have also noticed that immediately when I went into the tax return, there was a little wordy thing in the middle of the screen. That's basically telling the system to go and fetch the information directly from accounts production. So it's automatically gone and fetch that 127,710 directly from there. There is an option to uh, manually bring that in, and that's completely down to the user or the practice for them to decide. On the left-hand side, we'll see the data entry menu as it stands at the moment. I've got a bit of a combination of items that have already been uh, effectively reviewed within the system. You can see those with the padlocks on the left-hand side so they can't be edited. I've got some items that have been reviewed or, or completed but not reviewed, so employments in this case. I've got others which are effectively still in progress, business tax, uh, national savings interest, for example, a couple of items within there. Now, as a reviewer of the tax return, what I don't necessarily want to have to do, what I can do, it's completely up to me, is literally go through every single source, open up each of the screens to have a look to see what's there, whether it's been reviewed, whether the information has been completed. As a bit of a shortcut to that, up at the top of the screen, I have access to our return review module. And this is going to effectively allow me to go through each of those transactions but also compare it with the previous year's data. And we can see on the right hand side, again, some uh, ticks that correspond to some of the icons that we saw on the previous screen. Uh, we can look at any review specific notes that have been left uh, for me or by me for other people. And again, you can see that all of the numbers, um, whether it's this year or in a previous tax return are all hyperlinked. So if there was some kind of um, I don't know, let's have a bit of a big difference between this year and last year. If we need to do any kind of investigation, we can just click on the link and it will then take us back through to the underlying data entry screen. If we need to put more analysis, if we need to correct any of the entries, we can do so from here. Now, again, what I don't necessarily want to have to do is go through and complete each of the items. Once I've reviewed all of this, and there are some items uh, up at the top to 
enable me to do that. So for example, if it's already been reviewed, I don't need to review it again. I can just hide that information. It just makes life a little bit easier. But then at the bottom, I've got the option then to mark all of the data range resources as both reviewed and completed. And effectively what that's going to do is change the status of my tax return, which again effectively could update the workflow system, so that spreadsheet style screen that we saw on my homepage. And you'll see down the left hand side, it automatically goes and locks all of the other sources uh, that weren't previously locked. We've also got the ability in the top right hand corner of my ribbon at the top there to access the digital tax account for my clients. And here again, we're using CCH one click as that vehicle to enable me to grab that information from a third party of which HMRC is one of them. Review the information. I might want to compare it with the data that I've already got within personal tax and if necessary. I can send it directly to the tax return. So assuming that we're okay with the, the, the data that HMRC have and that it is correct, rather than having to retype any of that information, it can then be sent directly to the tax return without any kind of rekeying. Once all that's done and we're happy that we want to then send the tax return to our clients, we then move to the tax return bundle. Now the tax return bundle is a module that we have that enables the tax return and any associated items to be bundled up and sent directly to uh, our clients, my clients. One of the focus areas around this is the delivery and the creation of a covering letter. And that covering letter can be designed in such a way by your practice that it's very bespoke dependent on the detail and the data that's actually contained within your client's tax return. So it's, it's not a case of everyone's going to get the same letter and you'll probably want to include some specific items that have been detected, if you like, on the tax return and the tax liability and maybe some payment on account information. Now, I'm not going to show you at the moment what my bundle looks like. I'm just going to go ahead and create it and then send it to my client. I'll show you what it looks like in, the, in terms of what the client is actually going to receive. But at the top of the screen, I'm just going to tell it to publish to one click. The system then going away is looking at all of my rules that I've put in place within my practice, all of the different items that I've decided that I'm going to send, send the tax return, the back and schedule, the computation, the order in which I'm going to bundle them up. And you'll see that it creates a single PDF of everything and automatically then attaches it to a message. This message is not an email. It's a secure message, it just happens to have a document attached to it. You can create and insert templates for the messages. And again, it looks very bespoke. So dear Jack, it knows obviously which tax year we're in and it knows who the message is coming from. Obviously that can be edited if need be. And in my case, because I'm sending the tax return, I want my client to electronically approve it. I could at this point also include any other documents, any other files. I could send a copy of the accounts that we created earlier. It could be a copy of the bill. It could be something completely uh, different. It doesn't have to be generated or created within our software. You can just browse to it. If you are sending a document that actually physically needs a signature, then we do have an e-sign module uh, rather than just a, a normal uh, electronic approval. Again, the choice is yours and the choice may, be, may well be dependent on uh, the actual document that you're creating. So click OK and then click Send. Now you will see that it does share obviously some other functionality with an email type system. Um, messages can be saved in draft. Again, that's completely up to you. But you've also got the ability to implement a review process. So it could be that certain users can draft up a message, they can attach uh, certain documents, but before it's actually physically sent to the client, it has to be reviewed internally. And again, that uses uh, that, that task list that I showed you earlier to notify the people uh, who need to do that review that there is something for them to do. Now there you'll see uh, the message has been successfully sent. So what the system will actually do is send an email 
automatically to my client. So there it is. I'm logged into uh, my client Jack Smith's Gmail account. So there it is at 1121. There is a tax return awaiting approval. You can change the wording of this to make it even more uh, around your kind of terminology, I guess. Um, but that email will contain the link that allows my client to then log in. So this is my client now accessing CCH one click effectively. Um, you can see you can brand it. There's, there's my little logo that I've created. Jack will need to log in with his email and a password that he creates. In my case, and maybe many uh, of your clients' cases, they're going to be associated to different entities. So my client, for example, is a director of Smith Electrical Limited. He's also uh, a trustee, I think, of the Lord Trenchmore Trust. Uh, in this case, obviously, Jack needs to go in and log in as himself, effectively, to have a look at his own personal tax return. We can see that Jack uh, probably isn't the greatest client in the world. Um, he's got 56 messages that he's not bothered to read. He's been sent 67 documents that he's also not bothered to uh, have a look at yet. But from within the main uh, area here within messages and documents, we can see that Jack can see that he's got 17 documents still that he needs to approve. Jack goes into uh, the messages. Uh, the unread messages will automatically appear first. And obviously the most of the red, uh, the newest one will be at the top of the screen. We can see there is a an attachment. We can see that there is something for him to do. There is an action that he needs to carry out. So there's the message. There's the copy of the tax return. Jack could just reply to the message. It is, as I said, a secure messaging system, happens to have a document attached to it. But we'll see where there is documents that are requiring Jack to take out uh, an action there will be a tick box on the left-hand side. Now, what we don't want to necessarily do is just allow Jack to simply tick the box to approve or reject the document. He needs to view it first. So he needs to click on see the hyperlink. That's then going to download it. And we can see there's my tax bundle. So there's 48 pages, what took less than 10 seconds to actually create. Uh, most of it is going to be the bundle itself, so the tax return. I've decided I want Jack to see the tax calculation first, but there we've got the, the actual covering letter. So we can see that in my particular bundle, it automatically knows that there is total tax due, it knows how much that total is, and it also manages to know by what method we are sending the tax return. You might have a different closing paragraph, as I've got, whether you are sending it electronically or whether you are still sending it through the post. It doesn't matter, the system will deal with both quite happily. Having looked at the tax return, and you might not like uh, the fact that he's got £122,000 worth of tax to pay, uh, but I guess he is going to approve it, so he now is able to tick the box. And we'll see down here, we've got the, the ability to both approve and reject. Obviously today Jack is going to approve. He will need to enter his password. So we confirm who he is. And hopefully I can type and speak at the same time. So once that's gone through, Jack's one-click dashboard effectively will be updated. We can see that Jack can see that he has approved that document. Obviously, we need to be alerted of that as well back in the practice. So you'll see a little pop-up up here in the bottom right-hand corner of my screen if you've got Central open. You will also get an email notification in a similar way to the one that Jack uh, received initially. But if I just go into my, my client record again, and we'll see the document center. This is our document management system. And we can see there's the tax return um, that I sent with a preview of the tax bundle with the covering letter. And again, you'll see that there is a one-click approval and we're able to immediately see who approved it, obviously Jack in this case, uh, and when it was approved, 11.26 on today's date. 
So that was a, a very short and snappy uh, walkthrough of, I guess, a, a short tax return process, but bringing in the information electronically, there was no method of me doing any manual data entry, brought in the information from accounts production, combined it with some information that was already in the tax return or from within the DGA, to again then send it electronically uh, directly to HMRC. I think back to you, Matthew. Matt. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, if there are any questions. Um, if there aren't, I don't think there's any in the Q&A. Phil, any in, in the Q&A? Uh, we have no questions in the Q&A at the moment. Um, but if anyone would like to pop any questions in last minute, that would be great. We're more than happy to, to let's, let's challenge Lee. So, you know, let's, uh, let's give him some tricky questions if you can think of any. If not, it just remains for us to, to wrap up. Um, firstly, thank you to everybody for participating. Um, still over 100 people on the call, which is amazing. Um, thanks to Phil and Rebecca uh, and to Lee for um, your participation as well. Um, as mentioned, uh, we will be following up uh, with sending everybody a recording of this uh, meeting, uh, plus uh, our details should you wish to get hold of us. Uh, so on that note, I bid you all um, adieu and uh, have a very good rest of the day and week. Um, and um, who knows when the next one of these will be. I think it's been very successful. So we'll look to see if we can provide some additional value. And uh, uh, if you've got suggestions as to who we might wish to to include on, on a session like this, then please let us know. Thank you very much indeed and goodbye. Thanks, everyone.